Okay, warm welcome from Geneva, Switzerland uh, for this um, final webinar for 2018 of the uh, Immunization Monitoring Academy. The focus will be on digital systems for immunization. And as we see attendees um, joining the session, I want to warmly welcome all of you, whether you are um, active participants in the uh, level one uh, certification course of the IMA, but if you are scholar companists or if you are members of the IMA uh, interested in attending this, these, this and other uh, webinars. So uh, I see Cameroon has been first on the Mentimeter um, and um, for Abid Hussein, who just um, identified himself as being from Pakistan in the chat, uh, let me introduce you to the first of two tools that we will be using uh, in this webinar. So if you are returning participants, you've been here before, you know we use Mentimeter um, for you to have a voice. And it's one of the two ways in which you can participate in this webinar beyond listening to uh, our presenters. So to introduce this tool, I see uh, participants from Cameroon, Bangladesh, Indonesia, Nigeria, and the USA have found, figured out how to use it. So what we need you to do, if you're on your desktop machine, pull out your phone and go to your web browser. So this is where you can type www.menti.com. You know, um, and this happens in your web browser, does not happen in Zoom. Go to your web browser. Um, so you need to go to www.menti.com and then use the code 344870, all right? And then you'll be able to enter your country's name into the box. But first you need to go to the website and then you use the code. So for Tariku Berhanu, thank you for introducing yourself and telling us you're from Ethiopia. What we need you to do is to go to menti.com there you will type the code 344870, and then you'll be able to type Ethiopia, and that's how your, your voice will count as a participant uh, from uh, Ethiopia. And uh, same for Ruben Kofie, uh, who is originally from Ghana and connecting from Pakistan. So we need you to go to menti.com and use the code 344870 in order to tell us uh, that you're currently connecting from Pakistan. Uh, same for Somawina. And Wigbu, and right now 26, uh, we have over 100 people in the room. Uh, so warm welcome to you all, but only 27 have actually told us which country they are from. Um, so Nigeria is uh, well represented together with Ghana and Myanmar. Um, and then we have Indonesia, Sierra Leone, Kenya, Tanzania, Afghanistan. So if you're actually using your phone to access the webinar to get to Zoom, you can safely you know, leave, uh, go to your home screen. So you should still be able to hear me and then go to your web browser. It could be Chrome, it could be Safari, it could be something else. Um, and type the website menti.com, M-E-N-T-I dot com and use the code 344870. So before you leave Zoom, write down the code 344870 on a slip of paper or just keep it in your mind because you will be asked this code once you get to menti.com. So we'll be using this tool. Jan Grevendonk has prepared a series of questions for you where you will be able to invite it to and encourage to give your input. Here, we're just asking for your country's name, but we'll be asking many other questions throughout the uh, webinar. So if you figure out how this works now, you'll be able to participate fully um, in the next 90 minutes or um, 86 minutes of this uh, of this webinar. So for uh, Navid Saeed from Pakistan also, please have you been to um, the menti.com website so you can add Pakistan. I see um, there's a few of you from Pakistan who have in fact uh, been to menti.com so the country appears. Um, Yola, so Yusuf Wakili from Nigeria, have you been to menti.com? Uh, please do so if you have not yet uh, done so. Let's see, and we have, so go to your web browser, menti.com, and then use the code 344870. We're almost um, almost at the halfway mark, so 
almost half of you have figured out how to do this. And this is one of the two ways, but there is a second way, which I'm going to tell you about in a little bit, um, through which you can fully participate in this webinar. And you'll need to clearly distinguish the two. So we only have 49, 50, 51, 52. Okay. And we have, so the countries with the greatest number of participants who figured out how to use menti.com in this session are from Nigeria, uh, Nigeria, India, Pakistan, Kenya, Myanmar, Bangladesh, Ghana. Um, the bigger the country name, the more participants have entered that country's name in Mentimeter. So make your voice count. Here we're just asking what country you're connecting from, but we'll be asking more substantive questions in relation to the topic of this uh, uh, webinar as, uh, as we proceed. All right, so we're um, almost at the halfway mark. Yes, <laughs> thank you, Jan. Um, so the ground rules, um, are before you, take your time to consider each bullet point. And um, you know, here is where we can introduce to you the second uh, uh, option you have to fully participate in the webinar. And if you look in the Zoom, so come back to Zoom if you're on menti.com, come back to the Zoom application. And if you look, look for the item called Q&A, so question and answer. It's a little, it looks like a, I don't know, it looks like a, it's a little rectangle. Yes, Ellen Shibika, Shibika uh, from Zimbabwe has just found it. Now the Q&A tool is not to introduce yourself, uh, but to ask questions to the panelists and questions are to share your testimony for consideration by the, by the panelists. So I'm going to dismiss your question, Ellen Shibika, and you, but you found the Q&A panel and I hope others have as well. And the way you use it is you can type and submit your question about the topic uh, today. Uh, so that is a Q&A. Now, the Q&A is not only for asking questions. As questions pile up in the Q&A, uh, we will not be able to answer all the questions. So what we need you to do is to vote on the questions that you feel are the most important, the most interesting, the ones that you really would like to see Jan Grevendonk and his guest today, Carolina Danavaro, uh, answer and tackle and, and uh, discuss. You, know, um, you can also comment on questions that have been submitted. So if you'd like to answer them yourself, you may do so. And the way you, um, you, Vote on questions, look for the little thumb icon with a raised, yes, sir, or the little hand icon with a raised thumb and click on it. So there's a little hand icon with a raised thumb uh, by next to every question. Click on it if you feel that question is, is really important and, uh, uh, and, and really good. So do not be disappointed if uh, we're not able to answer all your questions. Right, and some of you are clicking on the uh, thumbs with the Mentimeter, which is fine, but that's not the Q&A tool that we're talking about. So uh, definitely um, you're welcome to use this. So I think that's it for the ground rules. Now, please to uh, hand it off to uh, Jan Grevendonk and his uh, guest today. Uh, yes, thank you very much, Rita. Uh, just to introduce first uh, the guest who is of scholar fame. So Carolina has been uh, facilitating or driving the courses on uh, service scholars. So, Carolina. Hello. Uh, good morning or afternoon, everyone. I'm glad to be here uh, interacting with you in, the, in this webinar. Uh, so, we will be kind of sharing the slides uh, and also kind of uh, try to answer your questions. Uh, we also count on you to answer a lot of questions and uh, propose stuff to, uh, to actually present. First of all, also to say that you can, as always, you will find uh, the recording and the presentation in the link that you see on the bottom. So it's called www.tinyurl.com ima slash resources. And in that link, I also kind of have put a little bit more resources even for previous webinars. Uh, just to remind you that we had already a series of five and this is the sixth webinar. So we started with data improvement planning. We uh, talked about global data and uh, where you can find it. We talked about uh, data use, uh, denominators uh, last week about uh, HMIS and integration. And this week we're going to talk about digital systems. Uh, and you will kind of find all the resources and the presentations and the recordings uh, in, that, uh, in that Dropbox, and so in that shared folder.
Uh, before we go ahead, I would like you to ask. I would like to ask you again, like, where do you work? Do you work at the health facility level, the district level, state, region, province level, uh, national level, or at the global level? Uh, so for that, uh, if you can uh, go back to menti.com, uh, use code thirty four forty eight seventy, and let us know at what kind of uh, level in the health system you work. It's interesting for us uh, to know how to focus our questions and answers, and also to know what kind of people from the health system are participating. It's really good to find that actually uh, more than half, normally if we ask this question, more than half of you actually are coming from the subnational level, which really indicates that there's a tremendous um, desire and willingness to learn and participate uh, even uh, in, in these global level forums. And we kind of use that also kind of to inform our uh, next steps and what we do uh, next year again. So most of you are from the state, region and province level, uh, a lot from national level, also districts, uh, health facility level, and uh, a few from global and regional level. Uh, so thanks for indicating that. I'm going to not give it a lot more time. I think the proportions won't change a lot uh, when we have this question. So and just yet, to we have, uh, we have just received our very first question in the Q&A panel. Uh, so from a WHO scholar accompanist, uh, so for everyone else, uh, you know, uh, focus right now on Mentimeter, but once the Mentimeter um, poll is, uh, is finished, you can go to the Q&A question and vote on the question that has been submitted if you'd like to see the panelists answer it. Right. Maybe too early to answer questions because let me start first with the objectives. Uh, so what we want to do today is kind of uh, brainstorm how digital tools can improve immunization programs. Uh, reflect on, on the common categories of these digital systems, what kind of systems are we talking about, uh, and then anticipate and manage challenges and risks with information and communication technology projects. So if you can please also like focus your questions uh, on, on these categories of things that we will uh, talk about. We have kind of talked about different things in the past. Uh, I'm sure that there's still lingering questions about denominators, about data use and all these other things, uh, but we, will, we would like to focus on kind of more the information systems than the digital, digital systems in this webinar. Uh, we're going to do that. So as always, we start with a little quiz. So get your menti.com uh, ready. Uh, then we talk about reporting and data management systems. What has been happening there with digitalizations, uh, electronic immunization registries. So the normal uh, person based uh, registries, logistics from management information systems, geographical information systems, and we'll talk a little bit about do's and don'ts when you embark on an information systems project. And then we would like to uh, invite your uh, questions, questions and answers, but also your proposals to share your experience. So as Reda said to do that, uh, please tell us about uh, your experience with the use of digital systems in your context. Uh, why did you do it? How did they improve program management? Uh, but especially also what were the challenges? How did you address them? and talk a little bit about the benefits and the costs and the, the, pro the problems also that you encountered. Um, so if you would like to propose something, we will give uh, plenty of time uh, towards the end of the webinar. Uh, but for that, please uh, put your uh, questions in the Q&A, um, in, in the Zoom Q&A, so not in Mentimeter, but in Zoom, go to the Q&A, say, I would like to talk about X or Y and Z. Uh, and then for everybody uh, who doesn't really necessarily have to propose something to talk about, but uh, you can also see what other people propose to present. And if you like their ID, then we'll be sure to pick those up. So we'll normally take the ones with most likes, but we might also kind of select some other ones, ones that we think are interesting uh, that were not necessarily picked up by uh, the other participants. Right. So starting with uh, that, so we said we will always, as always, start with a quiz. Um, so grab your menti.com, use the code 344870 and tell us whether you agree or not. So I put there some things, uh, some barriers on, or some risks or some gaps that might be important uh, problems or barriers for IT projects, so information and technology systems projects. And let us know if this is in your context a big problem, less of a problem or not a problem at all. So you can rate is between not a barrier and an extreme barrier uh, or something in the middle. So what do you think is weak IT infrastructure and connectivity? Is that the main problem? So kind of 
lack of computers and kind of connectivity to internet? Um, is it the risks with software development? So you, you develop something, but it doesn't really turn out the way you'd like. Um, is it lack of IT support and technical capabilities in your context or your country? Is it low computer literacy, for example, by health workers? Uh, are there gaps in governance? Uh, for example, um, uh, not, not really a very well defined uh, e-health uh, guideline or, or, in, or infrastructure guideline. Uh, many people doing different things, a lot of partners doing stuff, but like not related to the Ministry of Health, etc. Lack of sustained funding, is that a, an issue in your context? Uh, I suppose it is in many places. Is it because you have an unclear legal framework on what you can do with IT projects? Or is it a lack of acceptability by providers and families? And as you uh, vote on that, I see already 50 people have kind of vote on that. And, a lot of you think that indeed lack of uh, IT infrastructure and connectivity is, might, might, be, might be the biggest barrier together with lack of sustained funding for your projects. Um, after that, it's lack of IT support and technical capabilities, which is also like always a big one. Uh, and then all the other ones are, uh, there's mixed opinions about that. Um, low computer literacy might be a problem or might not be a problem according to the setting. Uh, unclear legal framework and lack of acceptability by providers and families is much less of a problem or it's, it can go either way. So just to say that these problems might be specific to certain contexts. So the ones on the bottom are probably more like um, more likely to be problems in kind of uh, uh, high income countries. Why, while the ones more on the top, for example, IT infrastructure, lack of sustained funding might be issues more in kind of um, lower and middle income countries. Thanks for sharing that. I think that chimes well with what we think about what barriers are towards IT projects. If I may add, I would like to emphasize that you can see that usually the barriers are multi-dimensional. So there is not always just one barrier, but often in different types. And of course they need to be addressed differently. Right. So next question is specific to electronic immunization registries. So we will talk a little bit about electronic immunization registries later. What they mean is kind of, it, those are the systems that have like personal immunization records uh, digitized. Uh, so it's not aggregate reporting. It's really kind of, we register people individually and we track their immunization status with an electronic immunization registry. Um, but just to say like, I listed a number of potential benefits of uh, electronic registries. And we would like to get your opinion on what you think are the biggest potential benefits. Uh, and for this, you can actually allocate 100 points to all of these benefits and uh, tell us what you think. And I'm going to um, review them a little bit. Uh, so even as only two people have voted, let me start with track defaulters. Yes, track defaulters is something that is a tremendous potential benefit as people start moving from one place to the other. An electronic immunization registry that is uh, across the nation, for example, can still uh, track them if they default on their schedule. Um, monitoring vaccination coverage to a certain extent, that's also true, especially if the immunization registry is very complete and we can be sure it includes um, almost everybody. Yeah. Um, here, it will really depend on the denominator and whether you really manage to have like uh, every, almost everybody enrolled, or you might also have to use an external denominator from census, for example, to compare your um, administered doses to. Uh, generate vaccination reminders is also seen as uh, a big uh, benefit. It can aid with planning of sessions. Yes, you can even, uh, for example, uh, plan your vaccine availability based on that, on, on the sessions that you plan, because you can actually now foresee who is going to come where for what kind of vaccines, for example. Um, you can provide access to vaccination cards online to the citizens. That's also a good benefit. Um, you can link vaccination with used vaccines. That's also interesting, especially, for example, uh, if you would like to have better lot control. So for vaccine safety, you can now kind of link those lots to the, to the vaccination record and easily uh, find out where they went. You can even provide insights into reasons for long vaccination if that's how you set up your system. But the last one, and you picked that up, that was actually like a little bit of um, a distraction or uh, maybe uh, it's often kind of mentioned as um, a potential benefit that the registry 
can provide a real denominator, I would caution against that. I would say uh, you can, your denominator will be the people that you're able to register. So in some cases, um, and I saw we have Bahrain on the call and you might hear, hear from them. In some cases, in some settings, you might be uh, very sure that you are able to register really everybody who resides in your countries. In most places, that's actually not the case. Even in rich countries, that uh, continues to be a big issue. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you want to add. Yeah, I want to add that the registry, just a reminder, we'll talk about it. But by having the person and the vaccine of that person, it really allows you to know immediately what vaccines that person got, when they received them, when they are late, when they are on time, uh, when they have a contraindication, you can add that information. And as Jan says, it's not the cure all because you first have to be in the registry and you first have to be sure that you are only one time in the registry so that you are not duplicated and some vaccines go with one name and other vaccines go with a different name. So really the registry to work has to have certain features and we'll talk about it. Right, so we'll talk about EIRs later, but uh, this is to warm you up. Thank you for your feedback. Um, the same thing for LMIS, so Electronic Logistics Management Information Systems. What do you think are the greatest potential benefits uh, for those? Um, they can provide stock visibility. Um, they can help determine adequate order quantities, provide traceability of lots, so you can follow lots and batches through the supply chain. You can monitor loss and wastage, uh, temperatures in supply chains cold chain equipments, uh, they can help avoid stockouts and keep stock with min and max, within min and max levels. Just to add here that just like immunization registries where the, the system to track the people vaccinated, these are the systems to track the vaccines and the supplies. So it's a different, uh, the focus is different, but it's complementary. So some of these systems will be talking to each other, some mm. may not. Um, but also, in the future, probably they will. Also to add maybe that in many uh, electronic immunization registers, they already included um, kind of the LMIS functionality. And in those cases, we will talk more about maybe inform immunization information systems to indicate that it's broader than just uh, logistics. But in many other cases, we still have aggregate reporting systems for coverage and then LMISs for the stock management where they're similar is that both of them don't necessarily depend on monthly reporting. They really track transactions. Everything's, every time something happens, it is reported. For example, a registry tries to um, record every time somebody's vaccinated or born or registered. Um, an LMIS will register every time the stock is ordered, uh, moved, uh, updated, um, when a loss is reported, etc. So transactional systems versus reporting systems. And we'll come to, back to that later. Just to say that uh, most of the people who have voted, and you're only 50, uh, you say that providing stock visibility is the biggest benefit, and I would tend to agree with that. Like one of the problems we have in systems that don't have these kind of transactional systems um, or don't have a good LMIS, uh, you really kind of just send down stock down the chain, but you then never know where it went, how much is still there, how old it is, if it's close to expiry or not, in what conditions it's being kept. So yes, the stock visibility is probably kind of really the, the biggest uh, benefit, um, but also that it helps you determine adequate or appropriate order quantities and avoid stockouts that's actually linked to the order uh, of stock visibility. <coughs> you can monitor loss and wastage if you kind of are able to have people report that, uh, keep stock within minimum and maximum levels, also linked a bit to the stock visibility. You provide traceability of lots, uh, seen as a bit less uh, important. You can monitor cold chain equipment, and in some cases, you can even monitor the temperatures automatically online, especially in big stores if you have these remote temperature monitors. So all of these are indeed uh, potential benefits of an electronic LMIS, depending on how it is set up. Anything to add? Uh, no, not for this one. So going on then, so let's uh, give you an overview of the common kinds of system. And let me first start with kind of the first uh, kind of digitalization that we saw in immunization and in many other health systems. Um, and this is really for just reporting and data management. So really what we have here is that you have, uh, you had probably paper reports and at some point somebody made an Excel template to, uh, to support those paper reports. So basically instead of filling out a paper, you can now fill out an Excel template or at least at the district level, you can enter it into some database, whether it's Access or Excel or uh, EP Info, 
and you report your numbers, but they still kind of really it's very much follow the function and the fields of a, of a paper report. Um, so the benefits of that is that you support consolidation. You can easily calculate things like coverage. Uh, it's, it's somehow easier for archiving because you don't have to deal with a big paper archive. You can just have like a, a folder on your computer and copying and pasting information, for example. Um, you can al also for like maybe the first time you allow for more uh, advanced analysis and visualization. So you can make all kinds of tables, graphs more easily. Uh, but the challenges sharing can be cumbersome. So what we see often is that if you have databases at all levels and you then look at the information, they're almost always out of sync. There's always uh, different information in all of these if they're disconnected. Uh, and there's also management issues like um, we have problems with the backup, uh, anti antivirus software might not be always installed. And very importantly, the version control. So every time you introduce a new vaccine, all these databases would have to be updated. So how are, going, how are you going to coordinate the rollout of kind of a new database, whether that's an Excel or uh, an Access database or whatever. So I, I guess the most um, famous example here is DVDMT, the District Vaccine uh, Data Management Tool, uh, which is used in many African countries, uh, which is great. It has a lot of analytics and visualizations. Uh, it's also kind of cumbersome sometimes uh, to deal with and to share, especially if it's so big, so then you see people instead of having to send the report, they now kind of uh, share it with, with USB keys and everything, and, and it becomes a bit more difficult to deal with. And if I may add, some of these systems have the problem with the late reporting. So if the monthly report comes late, sometimes it doesn't get added to the, to the Excel or to the information system that already has been sent to the next level. So it might have that issue. Right. So then we go on to whatever we call maybe the second generation of reporting and data management tools, which now rely on an online access to a national kind of database, which has the benefit that there's only one version of the truth. It's easier to update, as Carolina said, with uh, late reports. Uh, they also allow for more granular data. So typically uh, these databases, like for example, DHS2, uh, they allow for um, reporting by health facility instead of district. So now you can actually have health facility data at the national level, which you might say is not necessary, but on the other hand, it's easier for transparency. You can go now to those uh, districts, for example, when you do a DQA, a DQS kind of thing, and actually directly compare what is in the database to what is in the books in the health facility. Um, but there's challenges as well, and, and we have to acknowledge them as well, that uh, even if like online access is now more and more there in most countries, for example, you're all calling in through uh, some kind of online access tool uh, and you don't have any problems with that, uh, even if you're at the health facilities. Uh, it's not always guaranteed and especially like to actually analyze the data, it might be cumbersome to log in, uh, download some graph, wait until it's visualized, uh, it's not that easy. It also requires more computer literacy at the health facility level. And there's other management issues that are maybe less at the local levels and more at the national level, but you still need to run and maintain that system, which might not be that easy or that cheap. Charlie? Just to add that most countries are going in this direction and some of these systems are going to be integrated. And I know that you already had a webinar on this, but, but that's another one of the beauties that may allow you for more sophisticated analysis now that you have more information about the health facility, about the districts. Yeah. And indeed, like we had a webinar about that uh, last week, uh, just to also remind that integration has a lot of uh, potential benefits. It also has some uh, challenges. We all know that collaboration is not always that easy. And then we come to the area of the electronic immunization registry, which is a little bit of a different uh, set of things. Uh, for us, electronic immunization registries in the context of low and middle income countries sound a little bit science fiction still, because it's a system where you have every person ideally registered, and then you put what vaccines are given to that person. And like other systems, this can be just about vaccines given to that person or something else if it's an integrated uh, system of registration. Um, the benefits is that you have the information about the person. So it doesn't matter so much where the person gets the vaccine, you can track the person. Uh, it's like having a portable vaccination card that, that you find and that you complete. Um, by having the person, you will have 
quickly information of who is missing, where that person lives. Ideally, you can link it to that person's phone number or that mother's phone number to send reminders, uh, recalls, uh, a schedule. And the challenges, however, is that for them really to work, you have to have everybody in the, in the you have to be able to access the record of that person from a different computer. So if I go to be vaccinated in one health facility and then I go to the other one to be complete and to keep me, my information, you would have to have access to my record. So it requires really ideally access at the service provider level or some way of ensuring that the, each person is in the database. Uh, they are not easy to implement they normally take years and years and years to be fully implemented. Um, most successful experiences are really at uh, state level or city level, etc. There are uh, some at national level. So there is cost and complexity because they require maintenance. And when you're entering a person, they also, if you have a problem, they do require some troubleshooting and some quick remediation so you can register that person and you don't lose, don't lose that record. Uh, the next one. Yeah, so something to add here maybe is also that um, one challenge I could have added here is not just the cost and complexity, but as also as Carolina said, like identification. So you need to be able to identify somebody kind of unambiguously, whether that's through a single ID or unique ID or through a number of uh, non-unique IDs. Mm -hmm. uh, next one shows the benefits. So the, the, the most uh, obvious ones are probably by knowing, it's like having the name says it, instead of having a book or double cards, you do have the, the story of each person in the system. So you can really identify who is vaccinated and who is not. And you can better plan when you're going to go, for example, do some default tracking, instead of going to every house, you know exactly where you have to go and you know exactly who is supposed to come the next month, etc. And you can do some reminders that can be, as in the example, automated um, with SMS or with a system, or it can some countries have lists of defaulters that then are sent to call centers, for example, and all the calls are centralized and they're still used by phone. So those are the, some of the most obvious benefits. The next one shows some other uses of data. So now you can really, um, provided that you have a good denominator, you can have a better sense of where people are not vaccinated. So you can see if it's people in what region, in what place. You can also monitor uh, in this example by months of birth. So you know how many people who were born in March, for example, were vaccinated in March for say BCG. And then when they needed to come back to receive the first Penta or the first DTP vaccine when they came back. So you can track coverage by cohort as well. So not only vaccinated in the calendar year, but also all the children born in say 2013, you know when they get vaccinated and therefore you can monitor also the timeliness. You know exactly if they are following the schedule or they are being vaccinated late. You can also record if the person had an adverse event and you know exactly what vaccine was given when. If you have a system that allows you to enter that a person was due for a vaccine but did not receive the vaccine, why not? You can put there, for example, that the person refused that vaccine or that the person has a contraindication, for example, for a live, uh, for a live vaccine like oral polio or something. Uh, and at the end of the day, this vac vaccination decision support, it's really helpful when somebody comes, it's a little older than normal, the system can tell you exactly which vaccine that person needs and are overdue and it helps you decide which vaccines to give. Next one. Uh, so also when you mix this with maps, for example, it allows you to consolidate the stories of the people and you know exactly where people live and how, uh, which vaccines and how many people have at least one vaccination um, um, of any given vaccine. And imagine in a case of outbreaks, this is really useful because you know more or less where people are in vaccinated in relation to where their cases are happening. Here also like, uh, just to add mm -hmm. that, I could have uh, added a graph that I already used for the denominator webinar, where you have like a grid or a table that shows people's uh, residence versus the place where they're vaccinated. 
And just like that uh, table, uh, this map also shows really that, you know, there's not much correspondence between where people live and where they're vaccinated. So if you're going to rely on a register that is local and stays at a health facility versus a registry that can really track people across uh, borders of states and, and in this case counties, uh, you get actually much more flexibility that way. So that's really an illustration of the same idea. And it, it shows you that, um, yes, what, what it says here, consolidation of histories really means that you don't have to start from zero when people uh, move around and across borders. Um, moving on with the uh, logistics management information systems, LMIS, just to say that this is actually a little bit of a broad categorization of systems that are working in the logistics and supply chain space. Uh, but really, if you look at these LMISs, a lot of them do very different things. And here I listed some domains. And by the way, you can also go back both for the electronic immunization registry. As for the LMIS, there's sections in the handbook uh, that I also put in the Dropbox and the people in the course will know. Um, but there's uh, descriptions there of what these uh, domains really include. But an LMIS, for example, can uh, include everything from vaccine and supply stock management. So where is your stock? What are the transactions and the, and the movements of stock uh, to orders, to cold chain, to warehouse management and forecasting and procurement. All of these are uh, quite slightly different or totally different domains. Uh, so some LMISs might work only in, in one or two of these. Some of them might work across. So typically what we have is a number of um, LMISs that do more of the uh, stock management and do that kind of at the last mile level. Whereas other LMISs work, for example, mostly at the central level and focus on warehouse management. For example, where is our stock in the warehouse, the bar costs and everything, and focus on for forecasting and procurement. So we call them both LMISs, but there might be two LMISs in one country that actually do uh, different domains, basically. So just to clarify that. Um, some benefits of an LMIS, so you can do stock control. So here, for example, you can see in this uh, province in, uh, I think this must be uh, Vietnam, uh, you can see how the stock evolves month after month after it gets received and dispatched to the, to the districts. And you see whether the stock is kept within minimum and maximum levels, for example. Uh, you can anticipate the stock out and take corrective action. Um, also called cold chain management. So yes, you have these uh, remote temperature monitors, for example, that can be used, uh, especially like in bigger cold chains that allow you to monitor temperatures online in uh, stores or uh, send as an alarm to some server when, they're, when the temperature in the fridge goes below um, a certain point or above a certain point. Um, there's also kind of much more and more use of uh, phones, especially for the LMIS where you really have kind of uh, apps that allow you to enter every transactions, enter uh, orders. And this is uh, an example from Logistimo, which is also used in the even system in, in India, where you can actually um, view stock, enter transactions, uh, enter and uh, enter expiries, etc. cetera. Um, for, here is an example from Pakistan, from an LMIS. I think uh, this should be uh, uh, the LMIS, I think, um, where you see kind of um, on the left a visualization of uh, waste stitches, uh, color coded on whether they're below or above some thresholds. And on the right, uh, utilization of cold chain capacity, whether that utilization is too high, too low, or, or just fine. And you can actually easily see the problems uh, from that system, which I thought was an interesting uh, visualization. Uh, if you show that, we also show uh, an example in India where this is one of the biggest uh, um, systems in terms of rollout and people who use it. Uh, it's called Even, um, and you see there at the left, at the right, you have that nurse who enters her stock transaction in transactions in her phone, and uh, on the left, you see then the dashboard that actually shows. Uh, where inventory is adequate or maybe below uh, adequate uh, per location uh, in India. Uh, so this is a very huge project and I put a reference here where you can find a lot of videos and, and information more about that. Now we have the geographic information systems or the GIS. Uh, they have been ex extensively used in polio to help plan 
Uh, some of you may have participated even in mapathons where you look at satellite pictures and identify uh, structures and then you know where uh, from the air, basically from the satellite, you know um, where people are or at least structures. It can be really helpful to help plan uh, campaigns because it allows you to have a better sense of where um, groups of people live. Allows you also, if the vaccinators go with mobile phones, to know where they are. Uh, if they are going where they are supposed to be going. And there is a whole lot of work now trying to map the, and estimate what, how many people live in a place based on GIS and pictures of, from satellites. Um, is uh, not yet so used uh, in routine immunization, but it has a lot of potential uh, possibly for micro planning and to better understand uh, target populations where people actually are moving to. Uh, you can also track how populations move over time, how they go with their phones to different places and seasonality, for example, of displacement of, of people that go um, to different places in, in time. Uh, there is a very interesting study, from example, from Namibia, that everybody goes to some place at, at the end of the year and then they go back to where they live. So it's a lot of potential here because we have GIS coordinates with the phones. In surveys, it's being used quite extensively to identify that people are working where they are supposed to be working in a survey, and also to analyze the data showing the pockets of people who are or are not vaccinated. Uh, next one. Just to add maybe here is that um, a lot of the experience, as we say, is uh, in the polio program. Um, because polio is quite well resourced and looks really at kind of the last pockets. Um, so a lot of what is being done is really kind of not looking at the expense of things and, and really kind of cost is not so much of an issue. So the use case that they have might also be quite uh, different from what we need in routine immunization. So I don't know if you will ever be interested in seeing kind of vaccinators uh, running around on a screen. Um, but we do think it, that kind of the satellite imagery can really help it, especially with micro planning map, for example, the health services or where you kind of uh, provide um, fixed and mobile and, and, and outreach services, for example, versus where your EPI community live. Uh, so I know about some work in uh, Myanmar that's going on right now to, to apply some of the same technology and the same thinking, but in different contexts. And then you will see actually that the use um, actually uh, is quite different of, often. Um, so also to say that for target population estimates, so it can be done, what really is needed for in that case is you need kind of, you need very high uh, sophisticated satellite imagery. You run some computer algorithm on that, the computer will estimate where your population lives. But then to actually to make that reliable, you need to complement that with micro sensors where you go to the place and do actually a very small census on a sample uh, basis. And that makes it actually quite expensive and, and maybe not necessarily uh, so feasible for us. So, but I think where the, the, the challenge for us is, is to see how we can use it. And I saw that uh, Imran, Dr. Imran, you put in the chat uh, that you're using this in, um, in, in Pakistan. I would actually um, urge you and other people to, if you would like to talk about these things, uh, put it in the Q&A in the, in the chat and in the Q&A in Zoom. And then we will call on you to actually also present that uh, to everybody else so that any, everybody can benefit from that experience. Well, here, one word of caution, of course, is the confidentiality, because some of these pictures really almost can take a picture of your face. Uh, so you really have to be uh, mindful of the uh, legislation and the uh, guidance in your own setting to see to what level of detail you can and cannot get um, due to confidentiality. And that's important, for example, in some of the surveys that ask multiple questions, including HIV status. Yeah. Just to say that there's a number of other uh, other uses that we didn't talk about here, uh, but we see a lot of mobile tools uh, for data collection service, for example, including in uh, coverage evaluation service, but also maybe API reviews, uh, SARAs, all these things. Um, we They're also used for routine supervision and session monitoring. So uh, as you know, in, especially in the polio countries, there's a lot of kind of the polio SMOs and everything that kind of now control or do super supportive supervision, uh, but a little bit independently of, of routine immunization. And then they will often work with a standard 
uh, questionnaire that they fill in and so you can see whether sessions are being held or not. Uh, and finally, uh, tools like that can be used in delivery of training and education. Uh, so there, there, are, there are other uh, uses. And again, if you have uh, anything to share, please do that in the Q&A because uh, we will call on you uh, very soon. Here, uh, there are even some uses where you just put your child's age and it can tell you what vaccines normally are required. Uh, so there are some also for parents and for users themselves. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the last um, slides here in the, in the type of digital system that we are discussing is one about adverse events following immunization and assessment of causality. So this is, a, again, a tool that has been recently made available by WHO here uh, to help when uh, countries are doing investigations of uh, a case that can potentially be related to a vaccine or caused by a vaccine. So again, um, this is available. There you have the, you will have the website there. Um, but if you just put the AFI causality assessment, it will then uh, send you to this page. And again, the more information you have about the vaccine, the vaccinated person, it may be, and how it links to the which vaccines were given, it can really help do better causality assessment. And I'm going to finalize uh, our presentation part and then we go to the participants uh, to your presentations and your questions and answers uh, with this kind of uh, eight do's and don'ts. And I'm also just going to say that in your uh, Dropbox, so in your shared folder, I put uh, a little guide that actually talks to all of these eight uh, steps. But these are kind of eight things to ask yourself before you actually embark on any kind of ICT project or uh, information and communication technology project. Um, and the do's and don'ts, uh, just to summarize them, I would say first think of what your program needs. Uh, don't uh, do something because the, the system exists. Think about what you need first and what your objectives are with it. Um, then don't underestimate the technical skills that are needed uh, to develop, but also to maintain and run uh, electronic systems. Um, third, be in charge of the requirements. Don't leave that to a software developer. You as a program people need to say what you want from the system. It's not a software developer who will drive this by uh, focusing on what is possible. Um, also, like look at what exists before you decide to develop because development is often like a, a difficult process that is very costly and uh, risky. So try to find out what already exists and see if you can adopt that or adapt it before you start with something new. Um, in the guide that I shared, there are some kind of tips that to allow you to team up with the right vendors, uh, consultants and partners. What happens in many cases is that there will be some kind of development partner with some uh, an ID to do something, but they already come with their technical assistant uh, that will actually uh, come with a full set of um, technical skills. So that might not be the right way. So, so just uh, think about that before you embark on such a pro, uh, program. And then also to say that your project will have cost maybe at least triple the amount you first budget. I'm just saying that as something provocative, it will be much more than what we initially think because there's all these hidden costs that you didn't even think about. And it might also take double the time to, to complete. I may say five times the time, but. <laughs> mm -hmm. and, then, uh, for, and then finally kind of analyze the risks and challenges uh, and you might just survive. So in this guide, we also put like a checklist with risks and challenges and also some tips on how you can mitigate them or at least uh, take them into account uh, when you start with a project like this. And then I think we are ready for uh, questions and answers. So I think uh, Reda has lined up some, uh, some questions for us. Yes, uh, thank you, uh, Jan and Carolina. So our first, um, uh, first person that I've invited to join the panel and he seems to have just left, uh, he was in front of his screen a second ago, is uh, Morris uh, Kyogo. So let me uh, go and look up um, Morris, uh, Morris Kyogora. Uh, he says, I am in a country that is struggling to fully implement the immunization data capture using the paper-based records and aggregate through the HIS reporting. Recently, they have introduced e-registers with piloting being done in some provincial hospitals. The staff literacy level, however, is inadequate. 
is it justifiable to go ahead and roll out this even when the paper registers are not correctly and accurately used now we would have wanted uh, let me see i'm going to try to unmute Morris Kyogora, but he seems to have stepped away from his computer just when we were going to uh, uh, to hear from him. I'm not sure what, what happened so, there. Reda, so I can address a question, but maybe I'll, I'll wait until uh, Morris okay. appears on the screen. But there's also like some other questions that people ask. Maybe I can in the meantime try to reply to those uh, online. Okay, then, great. Yeah. So uh, Alain Bless uh, uh, mentions that connectivity, verticalization, uh, health system weakness, and poor governance are the big challenges faced by digital tools in low and middle income countries. Any thoughts? So first of all, yes, Alain, we very much agree. Uh, so a lot of these projects are in the pilot phase often. Um, they focus on something uh, quite uh, narrow. Um, so I don't say that that's always uh, it's, it's always inappropriate. It might be inappropriate. For example, I firmly believe that electronic immunization registries can live as a standalone thing, so they don't have to include HIV uh, status or, for example, the tuberculosis registries, just because those are also registries. Um, but yes, we have to think well about how to how all this kind of how, the, how all these applications live together. So really, good um, good kind of collaboration at the at the national level is always one of the biggest challenges with this. Um, I would also add to that that a lot of these projects are not there because countries have decided to do them, but because some development partner came with this idea and then the country uh, agrees to take it on. Um, connectivity is always is also an issue, especially at uh, the health facility issue. Um, and then maybe I'm, I am going to ask Morris's, answer Morris's questions because I think it's a good question. Um, I would say that, um, so yes, we, we struggle, if you already struggle to capture all the aggregate uh, data from uh, the health facilities. Uh, so here we're talking normally about uh, district level connectivity, if you can't uh, even guarantee that, then I would think it's too early to come up to actually uh, introduce an electronic immunization registry at national scale. However, um, there might also be electronic immunization registries that can be quite useful in even one clinic or one district or uh, an urban, uh, like a capital or something. So it's not to say that these things don't have a place, but it will be too early to do that at the national scale. So you have to think about the maturity, about uh, the context that is there and especially the infrastructure. So many people talk also, I see in the, in the, in the Mentimeter, that yes, um, connectivity is a problem. So if you can't guarantee that, uh, registries might not uh, be the right thing for you to do at the national system and across uh, across uh, the board. Carolina, uh, do you want to add Yes, that? I would add that before embarking on a registry, you really need to do an assessment of readiness. Is your setting ready to have a registry? And you, in, in that readiness, you look at factors like governance. What are your policies for data confidentiality? What are your policies for how data is transmitted, if data can live in a cloud, in some countries it cannot live in a cloud, it needs to live in a server, you have those servers. Then the infrastructure, what kind of technology and electricity and connectivity you need. Uh, and then even the people, what kind of age and, and digital literacy your health workers or the people who are going to be using it have. So there are some, uh, some um, elements to support uh, this type of assessment. WHO will be working more on this in the coming years. Uh, in the meantime, somebody's asking uh, any country that has started this. Yes, there are experiences, mostly middle income countries. Uh, PAHO put out a guide um, this year, I think. And that guide, I don't know if it's going to be in the resources, but it's a resource that can be available that has many case studies. There are examples of countries that have used a, re a registry and then it went bad and they had to go back to aggregated data. Uh, that's also published. And um, just to add again that for the, for the registries, they are, um, it's work in progress. You have to also see what do you do with all the sectors. You have to um, see what you do with your privates. If they have a registry already, how you integrate that information with the national registry. Uh, how you export data, etc. So um, costs and timeframes are very, very, very variable, and that's in that guide that Jan uh, presented for any information system. 
So really it will vary enormously depending on the setting, the approach. Uh, so really think be well, develop a committee before starting any of these things. Yeah. Isaac Mugoya also asked in the chat in the Q&A and I'll just answer it because it's on the same topic. So examples of electronic vaccine registries and then there's a few people in Mentimeter. Uh, so yes, as Karina said, uh, we see it well established in many higher income countries like Scandinavian countries, Australia, New Zealand, uh, to some extent the United States, uh, quite a lot of European countries. Yes, we also see it in kind of the uh, low, like the middle income countries like uh, Colombia, uh, Chile, Brazil, uh, in power quite a lot, but also in Europe again. Now, uh, lower income countries and uh, especially African middle income countries, for example, so there have been kind of larger scale projects, especially with project BID, so the Better Initiative, uh, Better um, Immunization Data Initiative, uh, where in Tanzania and Zambia there's very large uh, pilots and they kind of do quite a good job in documenting the challenges also of that. So just to say that on that topic, we're going to uh, work on a, a guide that talks about this country readiness and try to really kind of uh, write that up in a document. That document is really not there. Right now, uh, the information is there in terms of like a lot of project experience from, for example, the PATH BID initiative uh, and others, uh, also like SHIFT1 and everything. Mm -hmm. um, Reda, next question. Okay, um, so as you can see, uh, there are a number of uh, participants who have joined the, uh, uh, the panel. And uh, beyond the questions, I thought it'd be interesting to ask some of them, uh, to ask them what, what do they have on their mind? What are they, you know, what are they faced with um, in terms of the challenges? Um, and so let's go to, um, we have a, let's see, let's try uh, Paul Senge. So his comments has uh, uh, already his question specifically, I believe, has already uh, been addressed. It was when immunization coverage is over 80%, how do countries ensure the unimmunized 20% of the population have easy access to immunization? So, Paul Senge, I hope you can hear me yeah. and that you are able to speak to us. Yes, I hear you. So yeah, welcome. I hear you. Please tell us where you are connecting from and um, tell us how your question, what did you have in mind with respect to the effective use of digital systems for uh, immunization. Yes, I'm, I'm connecting from Freetown, Sierra Leone. Are you hearing me? Yes, loud and Good. clear. Yes, so of course, we all are aiming for high coverages. But when we get to over 80%, particularly in those areas of the vaccines and immunizations like uh, DPT3, uh, measles, and all that, it becomes really very difficult, particularly those areas where they are inaccessible and all that. So the 20% is the one that is a problem. So I'm just talking about the fact that we were talking about routine immunization sessions last year, but sometimes routine immunization to cover this 20% that is fairly inaccessible is a problem. So what do we do to ensure that almost everybody gets immunized? Yep. Yes, well, ahead, that's, yeah. a, that's a very good question. So we think that first of all, like uh, electronic systems can be part of the answers, but they're almost never the only part of the answer, right? So I think there's a number of things we need to uh, discuss and, and I think you're right. So once you get to 80%, it's really hard to move on from there. So you need always more and more refined uh, strategies and tools to help with that. Um, so whether then we, that means that we need to jump to an electronic immunization registry, I'm not saying. So it can be part of the answer. It's not always uh, the right answer. So I think, first of all, we talked about equity a number of uh, seminars ago, webinars ago, where we said that uh, moving away from reaching every district and really try to find like within every district who are the unreached populations and do we need to kind of come up with special strategies to, to address them and actually find them and immunize them. That is probably the most important thing. Now, can electronic, can electronic systems work with that? Yes, we think it can. And, and we talked about the geographical information systems that help you to really kind of, for example, map those populations, put them, for example, put uh, urban slums on a map uh, where they not might be on, on normal maps, put them at least, identify them through satellite imagery, for example, um, have like specific denominators or targets for uh, under immunized uh, populations. That's another idea that we talked about in the webinar on denominators. Um, 
And then can electronic immunization registries work? Uh, for example, in Liberia, um, I think it, it could, for example, in, 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 the, in the capital, for example, or in the big cities, it can have really kind of a big impact um, and it can be a useful solution. I would really caution people to think that this is something that is easily expanded across uh, any country, uh, um, especially a country with, with big infrastructure uh, and connectivity issues. Carolina, do you want to add to that? Yes, I think um, we are no longer with one solution is going to solve everything. And you can have a country with a, a variety of solutions depending on what part of the country. So, for example, in rural areas, it may be easier and better and more practical to have a good TICO file or double vaccination card to track your defaulters, identify the people and go out and look for people. Whereas in an urban area, maybe you have uh, the need to have more sophisticated tools because people move much more. Uh, slums appear and disappear all the time. And therefore you probably have to have strategies that are very tailored to where you are. Yeah. So also to say that uh, we have some questions here also, and they're all good, so keep them coming, please. We're not addressing all of them. Mm -hmm. um, but yes, to say also that a number of people in the chat and also in Mentimeter put uh, going to electronic registries or actually registries can reduce falsification, um, uh, reduce dropout. So that is probably true because first of all, like falsification, if you do it in an aggregate system, is quite easy. You just have to make more ticks on a, on a tally sheet and nobody can really control whether this was uh, reality or not. In a registry, you would really have to be quite uh, brazen with the falsification. So you would have to register somebody and say they're vaccinated even if they're not, for example. So that becomes much more easy to control and also people will not normally do that. So that's all true. It's, 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 it's correct that, that these are um, also potential benefits of uh, registration versus tallying. I would also say that in the previous um, Q&A, somebody asked, uh, will the WHO provide an electronic immunization registry for use by all? Uh, so we're actually uh, shying away from that. There's quite enough um, uh, registry systems out there. So we have SHIFO, um, we have the systems that are used by uh, BID in Zambia and Tanzania. There's also kind of uh, systems that were uh, developed by Project Optimize and that are now being implemented in smaller countries as well. Uh, which is an open source. So I think you can have, you can get access to those. And uh, if people really uh, are interested in kind of looking at different solutions, we can probably help uh, them do that and uh, list all these solutions, which is also not something that right now uh, is there. But um, what I would say is, first of all, like WHO is not making WHO tools and systems because we are not a software company and we can't really uh, maintain that. Um, but also I would say, I would caution you against developing something from new there's actually quite a lot of systems out there that could be uh, okay. adopted or adopted. Mm -hmm. The most important bit is really to understand the functionality that you need and the kind of requirements that, that the different systems need. And you know that from doing assessments uh, of readiness. Um, so thing. people, mm -hmm. um, well, Rita will ask the next yeah. question. But so people that uh, ask about uh, data system uh, on web or Android based, yes, there are those systems. And again, if you're really uh, serious about trying to do that, uh, contact us and we will, uh, we will guide you. Reda? All right, thank you both. Um, so we have 20, well, 22 minutes left because in the last five minutes we have, we'd let you have, uh, uh, Jan Gravenock will have some exciting new information. Uh, for you about these webinars, but now let's go to, um, let's see, we had Wandimu Bekele uh, who asked about uh, legal frameworks. Um, so let's hear from Wandimu in relation to the effective use of digital systems, uh, keeping in mind the topic. So Wandimu Bekele, um, are you able to speak to us? And if so, we'd love to hear from you. Where are you connecting from? Tell us who, who you are and where you work, please. Okay, can you hear me? Yes, loud and clear. Yes. Okay. Uh, my name is Wandamu Bakala. I am from Ethiopia, uh, working for WHO country office as a data improvement officer. I'm currently recruited as a data improvement officer for the country. So when uh, I see the disk review of the administrative uh, data, uh, most of the time it is very uh, 
uh, high as compared with the uh, DHIS uh, uh, survey, the demographic survey of the country. So uh, it's most of the time the reporting is uh, uh, of, uh, looks over reporting, you know. It's because of that to, uh, for the sake of uh, uh, administrative performance, you know. So how could we control this over reporting in most of the cases? Uh, the facilities report uh, 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 over than what they perform it as compared with the surveys, what they tell. So how could we control that one? Uh, or is there any mechanism? Or is this uh, digital system or the uh, computerized system of uh, immunization data collection as well as uh, management can control this uh, issue? And if is there any possibility of uh, uh, developing a uh, legal framework to control uh, such uh, over reporting this. Thank you. Thank you. I, I think your question I would flip it around a little bit because we are humans and we all act based on incentives. So I think in these cases, the incentives that are put there to increase coverage have been motivating people to pretend that coverage is higher to get the, the benefit. So I think it's most important uh, to put, um, well, there is a SAGE recommendation warning uh, a, a, about the risk of some of these uh, performance-based indicators. But I think some countries have had to do a data amnesty, basically, and say, okay, it's more important to report the truth and move step by step in improving vaccination coverage than reach just a number because that number, it gets reached by falsification of data sometimes. You can put many, uh, many uh, controls, etc. but if the incentive is still to, to report more because that's what gets you the money or a congratulation or prevents you from getting a punishment or, or problem, um, people are going to find out other ways to cheat. So I think it's more a question of the environment and the context and the tools per se. Uh, some people have asked about the legal um, use of legal tools. So what is important is that most countries are working towards having um, e-health policies where they explain uh, everything about the information systems related to health for that country. And they include legislation there. So it includes uh, what kind of tool is used, how the data is transferred, uh, interoperability, etc. And in those legislations, you can use, um, you can add clauses about um, falsification, etc. That, um, but again, if you don't solve the the key issue that it's why people are reporting more than is true, um, people will find ways around it. Um, things that have worked is the data amnesties, basically saying. Okay, we'll forget what happened in the past. From now on, it's much more important to report the truth. You put some audits there to verify that um, people are reporting the truth and you encourage and f congratulate people who are reporting correctly rather than reporting high. Thank you, uh, Jan and Carolina. Let's now go to uh, Millie Namalwa, so she, who has joined the uh, panel and Millie, are you able to yeah. speak to us? Yes, yes Jan, you I'm wanted to. Yes, please go ahead, Millie. We hear you loud and clear. So you asked a question, um, uh, just like the DHIS you, you wrote, is it possible to have the EIR system networked across health facilities to address the challenge of re reviewing paper records of clients? So could you tell us who you are, where you work, and why this question is, is relevant uh, to your work? and then we'll turn to the panelists. Yes, I'm from Uganda, uh, Kampala. I work with JSI under the Maternal and Child Survival Program. We support uh, Ministry of Health, UNEP, and Select District. Uh, particularly why I brought this one up, because when you look at the, the uh, monitoring system, from what was shared, we have uh, one of the biggest challenges, the use of the tally sheets. Eh? And as we talk about this electronic uh, information uh, uh, registration system, I find it very handy, more so when it comes to the 
child registration using the child register in an electronic version. It will help us overcome the issues of uh, of uh, duplication of uh, of records, especially when it comes to tallying, because that's where most of the discrepancies occur when people over tally and they end up recording falsely. So in a way, if the registries are really networked across the several facilities, then we can be able to do away with the client review of uh, maybe the child health cards, given the movements across the different districts, across the different towns, across the different regions. I find this very hopeful if, as we see the DHIS, by every finalization record, it can be very handy. So that was my point of discussion. Yes, thank you very much, Millie. And, and I think uh, we already touched on that, and, but I totally agree. So one of the basic problems with the tallying is that it's like, uh, well, you really uh, depend on people's um, diligence in doing that well and, and also honesty in doing that well. Uh, so it's a, it's, an, it's a source record that is easily falsified, as other people have pointed out. And even if you don't really want to uh, call it falsification, uh, it might also mean that since people already have a lot of work and administrative work, so they don't take that as uh, precisely as, as uh, other duties. So, and, and, and we agree with that. Like once you kind of really can, uh, can, can base yourself on um, a person-based uh, register, it becomes really much um, more robust information. So the problem with that is that if you have a paper register book, it's really hard to uh, tally and report from that what your monthly activity was from a paper register book because a paper register book is mostly, um, is mostly organized by birth cohort and not by when the vaccinations are given. Now, if you have an electronic register, then this is an entirely different thing because you can easily ask your computer how many vaccinations you have provided and actually use that information. So this actually makes the information more robust, uh, more trustworthy, I would agree with that. So Carly, mm -hmm. you uh, I would add the, the other flip side is that uh, if tallying takes time, doing a registry takes or can take longer depends on the design. So yes, there are uh, potential benefits uh, because you cannot falsify, you cannot, um, it, it's, it's also person to person, so it's more uh, difficult to do things wrong. Um, but also you have to consider the time and how it's networked so that you can access that person from different places. And those are the complexities and and the different countries are dealing with this in different ways. All right. Um, okay, so shall we, I believe that Jan and Carolina have identified specific questions that they would like to provide concise um, answers to. And then if yeah, we maybe before we go to the next uh, presenter, if we still have time, just to say there's a number of uh, pertinent questions. So GIS not allowed in Pakistan, we see this often actually in, in security compromise settings. So where GIS could be most helpful, it's actually uh, not always uh, the most appropriate uh, thing to do because of these legal uh, uh, restrictions or security restrictions. Not much you can do with that, uh, apart from maybe kind of, there's always some kind of GIS that is useful, that is allowed because you can still use maps. But yes, maybe the higher resolution uh, satellite imagery is not allowed. We, we know that. and. That's a pity, so we'll have to work with different uh, things in that case. Um, so I'm just going to uh, say those are uh, answered. Um, so we had some other uh, questions that we would like to answer live. So first of all, what does EIR means? Electronic Immunization Registry. So it means really kind of that you're not going to do aggregate reporting anymore, uh, but actually you're going to try to capture the immunization record and the person's record um, person by person. So that's really what we say when we talk about that. Um, somebody in this, uh, so actually Isaac Mugoya also uh, said this in the chat, in the chat, not in the Q&A, but I'll answer it anyway. So they have been talk, thinking along about electronic immunization registries and how to link that with the uh, birth register um, registry. So that is actually um, a great idea and as such, but they say, well, it was uh, difficult because of confidentiality issues. What, what I would say is maybe um, try to work with uh, civil and birth registration because often uh, immunization actually has better access to people and can help uh, complete the civil registration system quite well because many people uh, come 
their first contact with the with a public institute is actually for their BCG vaccination or birth causes. And even uh, if it's not at that point, they come later to the health facility. So it's a really good point to capture and register them. So just to say that this is uh, uh, maybe an argument you can use uh, next time. Uh, just to add to that very briefly, there is an experience in Peru about this, for example, that was recently published. We can put the, the example there. Yeah. Um, uh, so people ask, uh, so can we use electronic immunization registry even if we don't have uh, electronic access at the health at the service level. Uh, so yes, it becomes more difficult, but it can be done. And there's actually uh, maybe innovative or kind of low technology solutions that can be done. One of the things that we uh, uh, experimented with, with in Albania, for example, when we implemented an electronic registry there, is that uh, the district would print out the due lists so people that are due and overdue for a month, and they would print it out and distribute it together with the vaccines. So they will say here, uh, they would send a nurse her vaccines with a list of all the children that are due for her community. So then the only thing that the nurse would have to do is uh, fill in the dates of the vaccination when she when the children were actually vaccinated and put in the lots and then they would send that back and then this information could easily be entered at the district level. Uh, SHIFO, which is uh, a partner and actually an NGO, is also working I think in Uganda uh, and they're experimenting with smart paper which mm -hmm. is a little bit uh, the same thing where they kind of uh, collect this way information from the health facilities in an electronic format, in a paper format that can be easily uh, digitized. So there are ways of, of dealing with it. I would say at least at the district, you need to be able to guarantee really good internet access uh, if it can be done at the health facility. Uh, finally, the, the last approach could be the use of Android uh, applications or uh, smartphone phone based applications that you can easily that you can actually uh, that are more kind of uh, that have more offline functionality because in those applications you can just download all the due lists for example then complete them and it only requires you to have uh, internet access uh, from time to time um, so that's that uh, uh, just about the dhis tra e tracker because it's very common uh, it's not quite a registry because it allows you to uh, put the vaccines given but compiling and having all the information person to person doesn't quite meet all the functionalities of a registry, but it could potentially uh, be added into having one registry. Um, it can, um, about the functions of registries can help uh, reduce dropout, yes, and that's probably the best, um, the, the thing that has been shown to work the most, it's to reduce dropout because you have a better identification of the people who are missing. Mm -hmm. Uh, Nicolas uh, Velarde Gonzalez from Peru. Uh, good morning. Very early for you, Nicolas. Uh, you asked us, like, uh, will the late show do something with HIS and an MME initiative? Just to say that right now there's a little bit of information uh, in different places. It's mostly scattered. There's a little bit in the handbook that we distributed. But just to say that next year we're going to work on a set of guidance documents that will address uh, country readiness, as well as kind of some of these best practices, etc., and functional requirements. Any of your inputs also in like what guidance would be most useful will be very much appreciated before we embarked on that. And that goes, of course, for everybody. Like if you're in a country, you're thinking about using an electronic registry, um, but you don't know how to go about it. So what kind of uh, guidance would be most useful for you? Please let us know and, and we'll be very happy to actually uh, get that. So Nicholas is actually in the panel. Would you like us to uh, hear from him uh, briefly as we only have uh, seven minutes? Sure. All right. So Nicholas, I, are you able to speak to us? And if so, can you tell us uh, who you are, where you work and how, uh, why this question uh, that you posted matters to you? Uh, hi, can you hear me? Yes. yes. I am from Peru, but I am I have been working in Angola for the last uh, 15 years. I was thinking uh, because we are trying to to move to the DHIS2 as a platform for information system about any other uh, complementary solution that could be implemented. But the problem is I see there is a lot of uh, experiences around, but it's uh, very difficult for someone or anyone who can uh, uh, have a discussion within that country to know about any other alternatives. So I was wondering where it could be developed a place in where we can find 
and the state of art of what is being doing, uh, developed and implemented uh, world around so we can take from there input for any discussion or decision or proposal in, in any country uh, we are around. Thank you. Yeah, so maybe very, uh, very short. Uh, unfortunately, there's not such a thing as kind of the state of the art that is being uh, kind of described very well. So what we have kind of described is a number of criteria that we would like electronic immunization registries to correspond to. We are actually now working with, for example, DHS2, who would also like to propose their tracker as an electronic immunization registry tool. So we're working with them to make that also like aligned with that and to be able to, that, that that tracker at least corresponds to our requirements. What we may do is actually kind of evaluate a number of systems and kind of publish that next year, but this is only one of the ideas. So as I said, uh, we, we agree with you that this would be very useful for many. It is not there yet, but uh, stay tuned, I would say. All right. Um, may just also before you maybe ask the last, uh, last presenter. Um, so other people asked about refusals uh, in vaccination and how electronic immunization registries can help with that. And if it's even legal to refuse, well, yes, in some countries, it is uh, not legal to refuse for uh, some reasons, but it is for other reasons, etc. So where electronic immunization registries can help is that um, they can actually try to capture the kind of hesitancy that people might have. So they might capture if this is a contraindication, um, if it's temporary or it's not temporary, so which will have like a different treatment then. They can capture whether people refuse a certain vaccine, but not uh, the other ones. Uh, and this really can give us really good insights in why people refuse and why not. You can also like, if you notify a uh, refusal, you can then try to have follow up with them through a call center or actually kind of in-depth uh, interviews, for example. So this really is something that allows you to kind of start kind of some kind of communication with people in your community. As we know, like refusals can be very hard or, or more around hesitancy. If they're hesitating, it's up to us to kind of get them over the, that hump and make sure uh, they do accept the vaccination. If it's a really hard refusal, an electronic registry might not be able to help. No, it has been used successfully to, um, to monitor and talk to people who are refusing HPV vaccine in Chile, for example. That's one example. Yes. Uh, decision support. Uh, in many countries, there's kind of a little bit uh, more complex systems than just like a national schedule. So if you have like received uh, vaccinations, for example, from combination vaccines, or in different countries and you move to a certain country, it might become confusing for the nurse to know which vaccines is the next to give. So your app would actually provide you kind of suggestions or the rules uh, with a rules-based system to say which, uh, which vaccine is due next. So that's just to uh, say yeah. that quickly. It prevents missed opportunities, basically. Yeah. Um, Mustafa said, yes, it can be integrated. And what do you mean by integration? Integration and somebody else asked that integration can be used at a dashboard level. Uh, yes, integration really means that all of these systems kind of, they don't overlap, they kind of work together when necessary and information can be looked at uh, appropriately in an integrated way. Reda, did, did you want to interview the last presenter or be out of time? Shall, shall we hear from one more person? And uh, there are obviously more people with interesting information and experiences to share. Let's go to Navid Saeed. Um, so he originally uh, posted, instead of using paper documentations and spending costs uh, over manual tracking systems with errors, why is EIR not recommended across the globe? But then uh, he also responded um, to the discussion by saying the same issues in Pakistan and mostly with Afghan uh, refugees. Uh, this was the issue of chronic refusals. So comments, um, we have two minutes remaining on uh, either of those or both of those issues. So did you want to ask him to, to ask the question or we just answer it? Yes, let's hear Navid Said. Can you tell us who you are, where, where you work and why these questions matter to you? Uh, hello, I'm Navid Said, working as provision control room officer. It's like data analyst type of job in Fata province of Pakistan. Uh, I'm working basically for PI program. Uh, thank you all for providing me this opportunity to speak here. Uh, my question was specifically that like same country in the same country in Pakistan, we are using multiple systems like uh, in Pakistan, in Punjab, this is a different system. In Fata, we use Excel system. In uh, Sindh, it is something else. Uh, this, in some provinces, we have Android-based systems. 
Uh, so why not it has been made mandatory by um, WHO, like WHO can force, forcefully implement any system like they're uh, implementing IHR on us that each person who is going out of the country should be vaccinated. So if, a, if the same system, uh, some generalized type of software could be used, so it could be like widely used. Internet connectivity is a problem, there is no doubt. And it needs major cost and like investment as well. But we know that WHO is helping in vaccines, UNDP is helping in infrastructure, UNICEF is helping in education and uh, vaccination as well. The same Gavi, Rotary, UEPF, uh, PEP, BMGF is helping uh, us in uh, funding. So it is like one time, one time investment uh, and like there could be major outputs from this. So why not like it have been made uh, mandatory by WHO to use one common system? Thank you. Yeah, so thank you, Navid, uh, very interesting points. So just to say that right now there is a guideline review committee uh, going over the recommendations of what kind of digital systems we recommend even and which ones we don't. Uh, just to say that the outcomes of that guideline review committee seem to be that especially for the registries and the, the people, the systems that track uh, people uh, over their lifetime, is that they can be useful in certain contexts and when the context permits so. So if you say it can be done in Pakistan, uh, that's great to know. And, and I think um, it's probably true that in your part of the world, there it's really kind of uh, probably, uh, it, it, it's becoming more and more feasible. So in those, in those cases, we would recommend uh, to at least explore that uh, and, and, and gain uh, information and knowledge about the challenges also you have with that. Just to say that it's never really an easy solution. So even in countries that uh, have even more uh, connectivity, um, there's the governance issues. There's the fact that people don't really uh, work together across ministries. Uh, I'm sure in your country also across provinces, uh, they don't like to work together necessarily always. Um, so you need to get a lot of agreements uh, with different people. You then you need agreement on the details of the system, uh, who gets access, who does what, what the privacy issues are. So we would say, yes, explore those things. Uh, uh, just set it up as kind of a longer term uh, initiative. It's, not, it's never really a project uh, of uh, even like a few years. It takes longer than that before you have um, like full coverage of your registry. Um, so we at SWHO will not forcefully say use that system or that system, not even that kind of system. We, we really think it's the government's responsibility, but we are happy to orient them and help them in terms of evaluating readiness and finding the system that best uh, matches their needs. Mm -hmm. It's important to conclude. Yeah. All right. So we have three minutes remaining and I believe, Jan, you wanted to, you had to, uh, an announcement or additional information you wanted to share in addition to as you have done each week, asking how did we do, how can we do better? Your comments, your feedback uh, are really much appreciated and we need to hear from you <laughs> to what extent you're finding these events useful, relevant, productive. Um, and so please go to Mentimeter one last time and use the code uh, 344870. So 344870. Right now, only three people have told us uh, how we did so. And they've given us fours, which is very generous, but we need to hear really from you um, the um, comments um, that will help yeah. us improve and make these uh, more relevant. So maybe yeah. in the interest of the last few minutes, so thank you again for, for filling this out. And it's great to hear that you all seem to enjoy the, the webinars. So we've had six webinars. Uh, this is the first time that we organize a series of webinars like this. Like this, we had really good attendance. What we also see is that uh, attendance really varies from webinar to webinar. So in the English session webinars, we've had everything between, I think, uh, 450 and 150 people. Um, so we would like to hear from you, like, first of all, uh, what topics are you really interested in, in, in finding out more? So um, also, does the time work? Does the format work? Is this a good format or do we need to kind of make changes? So after you kind of give your feedback on how this webinar went and, and thanks again for all your generous feedback because I see we have like high uh, satisfaction with uh, the relevancy and your understanding and it might even allow you to do something different in your job. So thanks for that, but I'm going to open a new screen with your questions and uh, suggestions. And uh, so what I would like you to do is first of all, share any suggestion for a next series of webinars because we would like to repeat 
uh, this kind of series next year, uh, whether that's uh, during a course or not, probably during a, one of the courses of IMA. Um, but what we would like you to hear is what kind of topics would you like to have uh, discussed in those webinars. We might have to repeat a few of this uh, session of, of this series, but we can also like add in more. So if you think, for example, data triangulation, uh, subnational estimates, um, things like that. So in this case, yes, people are putting already kind of their uh, their comments in the chat and that's also useful we will look at that but if you can go to mentimeter one last time and um, put in your suggestions for next year's webinars uh, we will definitely take that into account also if you have uh, suggestions for the format please do so uh, and if you have even suggestions for the time what works well and what not please let us know and of course the time we know it kind of works for you because you're all here and uh, in the in the webinar um, but tell us whether you would love, rather have like a later or an earlier, uh, multiple sessions, et cetera. So uh, people mentioned data triangulation, which is great, which we will uh, talk about, mm -hmm. coverage evaluation service. We might even, we're going to talk with Carolina, but we might even have a bonus webinar uh, even in this series, but let's mm -hmm. talk about that. Um, some other people say, well, uh, thanks for the opportunity. Hope it continues. That's very nice of you. Very uh, mm -hmm. Data triangulation, yes, this is something that's a hot potato and a hot topic and we will definitely uh, include that and probably also con kind of combine that with subnational estimates. Um, if not, I'll leave this uh, open micro planning. Thank you, good one. Um, always interesting. Uh, thanks for the webinar. AFI, thanks. That's a very concrete, good suggestion. So just to say, we will repeat this uh, in the first uh, trimester or semester at least next year. Uh, you will all get invites uh, through your email that you have used to connect to Zoom. Um, in the meantime, uh, if you think about anything, uh, please let us know. You know where we live. Also to say that uh, the, all the resources of this uh, series of six are on the Dropbox or will be soon. Um, and with that, I'm going to thank you all for your continued support and uh, being on these sessions. Uh, Karin, you also uh, Thank you for the invitation and so, as always, send your questions, send your um, um, uh, insights, and let's stay in touch. Thank you. So, Reda, uh, I'll Great. leave it to the webinar. All right. Thank you both. Uh, thank you, uh, scholars and uh, members of the uh, Immunization Monitoring Academy who attended today uh, for the many great questions and contributions. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, of course, look forward to uh, what is what will come next. Let us know we're doing this for you to participate, to use in your work. Uh, thank you very much. All right, thank you. Thank you. Have a nice uh, rest of the week.